when you work for other companies, you're you're speaking with a recruiter, and that recruiter can't really tell you, you know, expectations clinical wise. Like they can't tell you, like, oh, you know, your your base population is going to be X Y Z. Welcome to Scrubs Unzip Podcast, where we unveil the stories behind the scrubs. And today I have a very special guest with me. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, yes. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Adebayo, but I go by Bio for short. I'm the uh, CEO and owner of StatMatch, the healthcare staffing agency. Awesome. So can you briefly describe your journey from nursing to entrepreneurship what inspired that that transi- that transition yes yes um also rushed the nurse um honestly i would have to say that i've been an entrepreneur um honestly all my life i, c- I can remember going back to uh second grade and um buying like now laters or candy i buy for about 50 cents and you know they come in like three packs mm-hmm. i'll take one and i'll sell it to like um, each of my friends for 10 cents, wow. you know, come up, come up like a dollar or something off of that. Oh, wow. But also it's my background coming, um, coming out of Brooklyn, New York and, um, coming from a Nigerian family. If, you know, if you're familiar with like the Nigerian culture, we're very, um, we're very much hustlers. Yes. Um, so I'll have to say I've been an entrepreneur all my, all my life. Um, it's just nursing helped to give me that push into, you know, a, a new perspective on, how to get that hustle up even better, you know? So you mentioned that you have, your company is called Stat Match. Correct. And so how did you identify the gap or need for a healthcare recruiting agency? What sets your agency apart from others? Yeah, I'll have to say um, it started during COVID when, uh, as you know, um travel nursing was very big for uh nurses during covid you know they were giving out you know quite a a lot of money for us nurses um but working for other companies you know travelers or nurses who work for um you know agencies will understand but when you work for other companies you're, you're speaking with a recruiter and that recruiter can't really tell you you know, expectations clinical wise, like they can't tell you like, oh, you know, your your base population is going to be X, Y, Z, you know? Um, so there's a barrier where you don't really know what you're getting yourself into. You know, a lot of us travelers, we go into these assignments blindly, like we don't really get the clinical insight or expectations of, of, of what to expect going in. So um, I noticed that gap is where you had a better relationship with your recruiter where you can, you know, trust them, um, where they can give you better clinical insight as to what to expect for your assignment. That's a better bond, a better relationship to continue on, you know? So I thought to myself, I said, hey, why not? Why don't I start a uh, travel agency where your recruiter is also a fellow nurse or a healthcare professional who understands the ins and outs? And not only that, it's also better for your client who's going to be the hospital or, you know, nursing home, school, facility, whatever, wherever you're trying to staff. Because you as a nurse, you understand the in and out. You understand what your fellow nurses need to hear and, and, and want to hear, you know, being um, truthful with them on what to expect. Um, and on the contrary, you know what your client, you know, what kind of nurses they need. You know, if you're working on a floor where... You know, sometimes your providers are not really going to be too reliable. You got to be a strong, independent nurse. And you're not going to place a nurse who just two years out the game, you know, and, and want to touch they, you know, touch their feet in the water. You're not going to place them um, there. So that's where I noticed that gap is um, a travel agent, agency by nurses for nurses. I told you yep. I'm waiting for this new place. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. Um, you so good. Oh, gosh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know, are you straight? 
right? And sip some of my tea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you were talking about how having clinical knowledge really helps um, when you are looking for people to fill up OP positions because I used to be a travel respiratory therapist and I've been wow. to um, Alaska, I've been to Hawaii, I've been to California, Ooh. Florida, nice. New York. So I basically wow. went to all of the places where I wanted to go. But when I went there, I was just, there was only research about the location, not the actual hospital. Because when I was showing right. up there, It'll be like, oh, crossing my fingers. I hope this is going to be a good one. <laughs> yeah. You know, going in blindly. That's what I'm talking about. But how would you have felt if your um, recruiter was a respiratory therapist who could tell you, like, the clinical insight? Like, okay, you know, these are the patient populations you're going to have. This is what you're going to expect. This is how, you know, if you get that cold blue going to ICU, this is what you're going to have to expect. You know, wouldn't you have felt more comfortable? Yeah going into your assignment like all right let's 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 get it definitely i definitely feel more comfortable and the track the thing about traveling during covid everyone was just like we'll get anybody (laughs) if you have a pulse we'll give anybody (laughs) scary times out there scary times And then they'll try to, like, bait and switch you and say that they Mm -hmm. won't be transparent with their pay. They'll have their pay, like, on their website, but then you upload all this information, and then you're just saying, like, what happened to that job? And then they're like, oh, it's not available. I was like, really? I just saw the website yesterday, and I applied. I gave you all my information. So I was just, like, there are some intricacies about traveling, and when you are a traveling respiratory therapist or a nurse, you're kind of like a independent contractor because like it's you, you like your recruiter really helps you, but you really have to go out for the jobs that you want. So how do you ensure finding the right fit for both the healthcare institution and the healthcare professional? Yeah, it, it goes back to um, using your clinical insights. So you have that conversation. Um, well, for one, you know, one thing um, I do is like uh, myself and the fellow nurses who are recruiters will 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 send out ourselves out in the field and work a you know work a shift or two or so and get familiar with the um, facility. Once we're familiar with the facility we can now have that um, conversation with any nurse who's looking, you know, for hire or looking for placement at the facility for staffing. And we can let them know, hey, listen, this is the skills, you know, XYZ is the skills you need. XYZ is what you need to expect. And, you know, we'll we'll assess that nurse um, skills and and, um, background and see they really will be um, a good fit for it because it's not going to benefit the agency, the nurse, all the facility, you know, um, just throwing somebody out there in the fire. So, you know, we're, we're, we're on the front, we're on the front end and back end. Um, and that's how we're able to um, determine, you know, if that fit is going to be good between candidate and facility. Okay. How do you deal with, like, I believe that there's a little myth that if a hospital needs travelers then that means that it's a bad place to work (laughs) because i've heard that they say like well if they don't need they don't need if they needed travelers then that means no one who actually lives there wants to work there so how do you deal with that um that pretense like before someone signs up yeah, I think that's um that situation is like there's I think there's multiple factors um in that because what if the hospital is like in a rural area mm-hmm. you know maybe it's not you know the population there is not you know high and uh, there's not that many nurses in the area and not too many people are willing to commute to work at that facility so location is one you know that's a conversation to have two um. I mean, sometimes that is the case. (laughs) Like, sometimes that is the case. You know, let's be real. Sometimes that is the case. So, 
Uh, your question is how do I like how do I deal with yeah. that? Like how how do I have that conversation? Yeah. Um, I think again, it goes to it goes to putting ourselves out in the field first to like assess and analyze like okay, what kind of facility this is, and um, if it's really just a facility where just unfortunately. Just based on the location, if people don't want to work there, you have that conversation with your nurse. Mm. If it's just, if it's a facility where the care is not the best, and you know, it really is the facility for for why they can't maintain their nurses and they have a high turnover, you you just have that conversation with your nurse too, and you let them know, like, hey, listen, this is what you should expect, and you know, it's the uh, it's hot over there, you know, it's uh, you know. It's gonna. It's a. It's a bit rough. You have to be very uh, strong, um, independent. You should expect. You, you should. You should expect your provider to not. You know, get back to you within the first ten minutes or so. You know, et cetera. So, again, it throwing ourselves in there first, and then being able to have that conversation from our experience. So does that mean you won't um, send people to places like that you wouldn't work yourself? No, not necessarily. Um, not necessarily. I had a case like that. Um, not necessarily. I I want to say I want to send people to places I wouldn't work myself. I again will have that truthful conversation with them on what to expect. Some I, I'm i sometimes I'm surprised. Some nurses are okay. Like one facility that's not right for one is okay for another. You know, like mm-hmm. sometimes I'm surprised that. Some nurses, you know, they're like, okay, I don't really care. I know that, I know, you know, I'm be able to stay afloat through this, uh, through that storm. Like, I'm, you know, they're able to hold it down. Um, and some is just not right for them. So everyone has a different preference. So I wouldn't say I wouldn't send one nurse to a facility. I will just be Upfront and brutally honest with them. Yeah. I think that's the best policy because... Not many people like to be blindsided. I don't think nobody likes to be blindsided. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we do, I know you try your best. And this is the first time I have heard of a purse of a manager or CEO that would actually go to the hospital first and like scope it out and get intel. Because most hospitals are like, are they want to hide stuff. Like they're not, right. they're the ones who are not, they are the ones who are not upfront and transparent. So I really commend you for that, for doing that and taking the extra time to scope it out and get intel for your employees. So that is awesome. That is really awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I think that's the best way to go, you know? Yeah. So for other nurses or healthcare professionals out there who are thinking of starting their own business, What's one piece of advice you give them? I would say um, start with your niche. Um, start with what interests you um, and what you're good at. You know, I don't know this probably is going to sound a bit off, but you know, some some nurses been on floors where the the patient acuity is so high that you you know you're constantly going into to, into your shift, knowing that you might have to start compressions on, on your patient god forbid but you know and then at some point you 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 pretty much a proficient bls acls you, you you already know you already know when it's time it's a two minute time um pause let's check the you know let's check the pause um you know so if you are well versed in that why not start your own cpr um you know your own cpr course uh, you know you could certify people bls acls pals um, some nurses start off as a CNA before, um, becoming a, a nurse and, you know, they still take the time to, uh, you know, do the hygienic care for their patient mm-hmm. as opposed to calling a CNA who's all the way down the hall and, and waiting a few minutes for them to get there. Um, but if you're still proficient in that, why not look into starting a CNA school in your state? Mm-hmm. So. Um, I would say start with what you know and what you're good at and, you know, think outside the box. If it don't sound crazy enough, then, you know, you're not, you're not, uh, <laughs> it got to sound crazy. Like you got to tell your friend and say, Hey, listen, I'm, 
I'm going to go to the moon tomorrow. And they got to look at you like, yo, are you okay? Like, <laughs> it got to sound crazy. And you just got to make it happen. Just take the chance. Just take the chance and make it happen. That is you know? so real because I actually had a CPR business in school. Oh, look at that. And um, in respiratory school. So I would train all of my classmates in CPR. And I, that's how I nice. got extra money to like pay my, yeah, exactly. my tuition. So I think that is a yeah. very profitable um, it, adventure and endeavor. And if you're passionate about teaching and passionate, because I've taught doctors how to do CPR and they don't know how to do it. <laughs> Yeah, look at that. It's not it's not amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like they don't put the mask the right way. They put the mask like the nose part down by the mouth. So it's like I've taught right. I've taught students, I've taught doctors, I've taught mostly all the people that I can get in contact with. And it, it's just really rewarding that one day like your teaching could actually save someone's lives, like outside of what we do at the hospital. Like what we what we do in the hospital is like getting paid by employer but once you take ownership and be an entrepreneur and use your skills that you learn to actually forward progress I think that is like commendable so I think that's a good right. um CBR business like even if you're even if you don't want to do something in healthcare you can do a business in um anything that you said you're good at and I actually interviewed Nicole, who's another respiratory therapist. She does laser artistry. So she does earrings and she does wood making. So there are a lot of creative people in healthcare. And that's why I started this podcast, because I wanted to shine a light on how healthcare workers are balancing their passions with their real job. So I think that is like amazing. And I know that you are a busy, busy, busy entrepreneur, uh, but we it. all need a way to unplug and recharge outside of your demanding job. What's a passion or hobby that keeps you grounded? Um, a passion or hobby. One thing, um, I'm, I'm also a barber, so I also <laughs> cut hair. And, um, you know, I find I find it relaxing when, you know, I'm still able to have a client or two come. You know, I could cut the hair. We have a um, conversation. Um, and uh, sports. I love sports, um, athletics. I love to uh, play basketball, you know, run. So those two things I would say definitely it's nice to, like, get away from the whole healthcare and just get some relaxation and, you know, be at peace and be at one uh, with myself uh, doing that. And I think all us healthcare professionals need uh, – to maintain our hobby, you know, something that always keeps us um, happy in our mind outside of that um, healthcare field because yeah. it, it, it could take a lot on the mental. You yeah, know? it definitely, definitely yeah. can. And I'm a living witness that it, it does, it does take a lot, but I really practice gratitude and even like in a code or something, like I just say like, thank you for allowing me to, add a few more minutes to their life and yeah. let them let the patient and the family have more time together so i really like like even the smallest things like thank you for having letting me get a chance to get a break to go to the bathroom <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like thank you for is. thank you for not yeah. letting anybody call me while i'm trying to go to the bathroom so like i just right i just uh, make sure that I uh, extend gratitude everywhere I go. And yeah, yeah, I just really love it. So I want to change gears. So if you could have a superpower to instantly solve one major challenge in healthcare recruiting, what would that superpower be and why? If I had a superpower to change it, you know what? If if I had a superpower to um, increase rates, you know, I would do that. Okay. <laughs> because I think that's a big barrier to, uh, um, you know, recruiting nurses. If 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 the um, you know, obviously, if the pay is not really hitting 
to what they feel is right, um, then, you know, they're not going to work uh, the job. And I understand. I, I've, I've always been there, too. Where I'm like, oh, no. But when you're on the other side, you know, for example, like um, we also help staff from um, home care companies and they'll, you know, they'll like introduce you to the family, the patient. And you, you generally want to assist them in finding care, you know, for their loved ones. And, um, you know, many times the barriers is that the the funds are just not it's not hidden right enough for the uh, nurse to actually take the job. So mm -hmm. it leaves the uh, the patient, you know, without a, a, a caretaker, essentially. Um, so if I had the superpower to increase rates or increase what like insurance pays out or uh, what these hospitals or, or facilities are willing to pay out, you know, I, I would love to do that. Yeah, I think that would be a <laughs> I think that will definitely help solve um, a lot of uh, staffing issues. You know, it always comes down to the funds. Yeah, because I know that inflation is very, um, like, it's something you need to consider when you are traveling, like, 500 miles out from your home. Like, you can't sleep in your own bed, and you have to rent out a place. So it has to make sense. Like, and even when you're right. duplicating expenses, like, you're paying for two places. So it has to make sense to leave your house, leave your family, to go to another place where you don't know anybody. Right. So I, I definitely, like, that's a good superpower because even during the COVID contracts, like, they were making, they were paying out a lot of money, but that was for the government. That was from the government. It wasn't from the hospitals themselves. So they had a little extra, and they were desperate. <laughs> They're not as desperate right. as they were, as they as they yeah. were back then so i think the times are changing so i want to ask you what's the next big thing or innovation you foresee in healthcare recruiting and how is your agency preparing for it yeah the next innovation definitely is the integration of technology um, ai technology like you know you see chat gpt blowing up and um you know um, other AI technologies, but I think AI is definitely going to take over recruitment. Um, I think it's like technology. Like I just see, I just, for example, I always had a vision of like when you, part of the recruitment process can be like the integration where whether it's a simulation, you know, um, a nurse can like vividly see the hospital, uh, you know, see like their, um, their patient population, probably meet like the managers and, and things all, all, all on their computer or, or, or phone or tablet to give them a more realistic approach on on expectations and, and what to expect, you know? But um, AI technology, definitely how are we preparing for it? Um, I would say we stay up to date on, on what the latest technology is and um, how other companies are integrating the technology into their company. And just feedback from um, nurses we work with too, like, hey, does this does this technology work for you? Did this make your um, recruitment process, you know, um, more simple? So um, feedback and just staying up to date on what what's going on out there. But AI, I think, is definitely going to take over uh, yeah. recruitment. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. And I just wanted to ask you how the so the AI, they do have like software that looks for keywords in a application. So how do you think that will affect applicants in the hospital industry? Like, do you think that they will miss some great candidates because they don't have the right words on their resume? Or like, how do you think that will play out? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that could be the case. I think um, you, you are right. There are like um, a lot of hospitals that use um, AI ready to um, source um, candidates, and um, that's the that's the that's the chance they could. If you don't have the right words on your resume for that technology to match you up with the job, it may bypass you. Um, I tell I tell all the uh, nurses, you know. Um, you know, sharpen your resume, like put down your experience, 
put everything down. Put put down as much as as much as you can. And um, you know, a lot of times we don't give ourselves credit for all the experience that we've um, done and, and, and what we've been through. Like, put that experience. Um, you know, explain it. Explain the skills you got from it. So the more you know, the more you have on that resume, the more likely that technology is to actually pick you up and not miss you. Yeah. Yeah, and I. So so it goes back to the resume. And I definitely think like resumes are important, but I mostly be- I believe that most positions are network based, and you really like I I really. Um, use my brand, my personal brand, to give me an extra leg up against all the other candidates. Like the other candidates might have more experience than me, but I make sure that my brand is consistent, that I know what I stand for. Like even all of my social medias, I make sure I have the same message that I want to change the world. I make sure I have that message there. And when I get attention, they know that, oh, okay, she's really versed in this area because there's a lot of people who comment on her posts or comment on in her social circle. So I think that is very important. Resumes are very important, but also networking is very important. And you never know, like your next job could be connecting with someone else in the grocery store. So you never know how your next opportunity will come to you. I agree with that for sure. For sure. Yeah. Are you saying that you use your, your brand to help you get um like RT, like like RT jobs? So actually I did. Um so my re- most recent job at a children's hospital um bef- in February, I did a talk. I did a presentation on mental health and health care and it was at the same children's hospital that I did that and I didn't know that I was going to work there like months later so when I did the interview they're like oh I remember you you did that talk that we that we attended in February so it was just and it was um the respiratory the Georgia Respiratory Society of respiratory care I know I'm adding too many letters but it was Uh the Georgia like every every um state has their own little society for like respiratory I'm sure they have it for nurses too so um for the Georgia board of respiratory care society I um I just emailed someone on Facebook um and they were responding to a post and I was like I would love to get to know you more and like just like have a coffee chat and then she connected me with someone the president of the board and then so oh, wow. once I got connected to her she actually uh gave me the opportunity to present to this audience of my peers of other respiratory therapists and then from that I was able to develop a book that's going to be released in January of 2024 so yeah i definitely am a pioneer of networking networking is can go beyond your resume because people have the no like and trust factor when you're looking at a resume you can only see the words and the pages but when they see your face when they see your actions they that you keep your word that you have good references that will push you over the top so that you can stand apart from anyone else Right, right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I don't want this to be too long. So the last um thing I want to ask you is if there's one thing you want listeners to remember or act upon after hearing this podcast, what would it be? I would say uh if there's one thing I want you guys to remember, it's, um, you know, like the Nike slogan, just do it and just do it. You know, if you have an idea, just just go about it. Um, don't be um, don't be afraid to take chances. Mm-hmm. Take that risk. Uh, I mean, analyze it. But, you know, don't be afraid to take that chances because without that, you know, how far can you really go? You know, I'm speaking for my people who are trying to make a change in this world, mm-hmm. whether it's for themselves, their family, you know. Um, take that chance. 
That is so awesome. So thank you, Bio, for coming. And we connected on LinkedIn. Yes, so yes, yes. Shout out LinkedIn. It works. <laughs> I told you that yeah. it works. You just got to send that message. You just got to reach out to yeah. people. So I'm so glad you took the time to be on this podcast. And if anyone wants, do you recruit for nurses and only, or do you recruit for other healthcare workers as well? Uh, we recruit for all healthcare professionals, okay. so nurses, RTs like yourself, um, social workers, NPs, um, MDs as well. We have MDs on our team, um, but all, all uh, healthcare professionals. Awesome. Yeah. So um, tell me how they can find you, and I'll put it the link in the show notes too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for one, you can send me an email if you want to reach out to me personally. Uh, that's my fr- my first name at a bio. So A D E B A Y O at stat dash match dot com, and I'll send it over to you. Um, you can also call us at nine two nine three one zero eight seven nine nine, or just you know check out our website, our social media and see if we have anything that may be of interest to you. Uh-huh. And um, and Marie, I appreciate you for having me. This is actually my first uh, first time being on a podcast. Okay. So, you know, Look you broke that, that ice for me. <laughs> I sure did. Yeah. I'm like really excited that, that I um, came across your profile. And I just can't wait to what you can do with your company. And if you need anything from me, don't hesitate to reach out. Likewise, likewise. I appreciate you. Thank you. So this concludes the episode of Scrubs Scrubs Unzipped. And please, if you like this episode or any other episodes, please subscribe, share, and leave a review. I appreciate it very much. And have a good day. And I will see you later.